A humble slave I am of an almighty Lord. There are many kinds of shirk. And the ulama have indicated, at least my teachers used to say, that there are two kinds of shirk that in our age seem to be particularly pestilential. We're not just talking about statues of wood and stone. We are talking about ongoing dark realities that compromise our tawheed. And these two are shirk al-ihtisab and shirk al-asbab. Shirk al-ihtisab means the shirk that happens when, because of our desire to please, somebody who is not our creator, or because of our fear of somebody who is not our creator, we do things that seem to be ostensibly religious. So if we're in the masjid, and there's somebody who we think we might get some benefit out of watching us, and our prayer as a result becomes a little bit longer, we have split the qibla. We have two qiblas, and that is a form of shirk. That is ostentation, a shirk al asghar the lesser shirk as the Holy Prophet والسلام, described it. And that is a catastrophe if shirk is the thing that is not to be forgiven. And nowadays there are some who believe that it is not just through hope but through fear that people are to be constrained into Islam. The one who barks at the poor sister whose hijab isn't quite right and she adjusts her hijab not 100% to please her Lord but to stop that man barking he has imposed a kind of shirk upon her potentially. Her qibla is split. She is doing it not just for fear of her Lord, but for fear of that man who is barking at her. That also is a lethal compromise in our tawheed. The one with the large stick and the angry face wishes to beat people because they're not complying with some ruling of sharia needs to think about the implications for people's tawheed of what he is doing. What if now they go to the masjid or they fast or they do some other good work, not just for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or maybe not at all for him, but simply because they don't want to feel those blows raining on their head. What has happened to that tawheed? And nowadays there are many Muslims who think that because of the political dimensions of religion, you have to use that stick to force people into paradise, dragging them to heaven by the scruff of their neck, as it were, a very strange conception. What are they doing to the tawheed of those people? In the longer term, they will find that they have no tawheed at all. So that's shirk al-ihtisab, which the scholars say seems to be a particular risk in our fragile and spiritually ignorant times. And the second is shirk al-asbab, the polytheism of causes. We believe in uh, an all-powerful deity, an all-knowing deity. No leaf falls, but that it is known to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates us and what we do. There is no other genuine agent out there in creation. He alone does things, and this staggers the imagination. We cannot imagine such a being or what the world is really like if we don't accept that there are causes. But we know in our theology that this is real. Everything that happens is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing. There is nobody who can rival him. He does not step back from certain possibilities in creation, limit himself, chain himself, that is not possible. So shirk al-asbab is the idea that things are out of control. Things cause other things according to certain laws or rules. And this causes, again, a kind of shirk-type anxiety in the human soul. People feel frightened because the world seems to be out of control. What if? What if? What if? And the believer is not like that. The believer has tawakkul and knows that whatever afflicts him is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whatever blessing comes to him is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He believes in al-qadri khayrihi wa sharri. He believes in destiny, it's good and it's evil, or it's good and it's bitter, the bitter and the sweet of it. And this is the essence of what it is to be Muslim, surrendered, accepting how things are. That behind the outward show, the scenery of cause and effect, there is the reality of the total unopposed divine control. And when we have that, tawakkul comes and again, the healing ensues. And this at least used to be one of the great gifts of the Muslim. If you really want to understand Islam, I always tell people, look at the prayers of the Holy Prophet. That will tell you more than a thousand volumes of theology. Prayer is where you can see the, the reality of faith, the humility of the human soul, the glory of the human being as it discovers Tawheed. And what are the consequences of this? 
Well, the consequence, and again my teachers have always insisted on this, is that where you see al qarib and you internalize that, you start to love creation. It is all his and it is all to be loved. The sign of true faith is the uh, upswelling of love from the heart so that you see Allah's creation not just as a bunch of phenomena, concatenations of DNA and atomic particles seem to be swept away and reconfigured in an essentially meaningless material universe, but as what Allah wishes in that moment, and he is ahkam al-hakimin. That's the transformation between those who know and those who do not know, and it's a huge difference. The one who sees Allah as al-qarib loves his creation, and loves human beings more than anything else in creation. Because it is in the human beings that these extraordinary qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are not just about beauty and majesty but are moral as well can be manifest. You can see the mercy in human beings, the, the justice in human beings, the mildness in human beings. And if they don't have all of those qualities now, you can at least see their receptivity to those things. Love them for what they are or for what they are called to become, but love them. And this has always been the way of my teachers. An extraordinary, compassionate regard of love for Allah's creatures, including the sinful amongst them. And this has always been the mark of the awliya and the great scholars of Islam. Human beings are what is intended by creation. And that's not a little thing. And that is our choice. Either we can recognize the infinite dignity and lovability and adorability of human beings, not because of what we are, just a kind of bundle of, of cells and organs and particles, not very pretty after a while, but because of the light of the soul, the ruh, that Allah has created in this clay. Either we can love them and really love them and see them with a loving eye, or we can follow the way of Iblis and just refuse to respect, refuse to adore. Why? because of his pride, because of his logic, uh, because of his false theology, his incorrect deduction. I'm better than him. I'm a fire. But fire is from our own autonomy, from our own inward energies, from anger, from wrath, from pride. Too much of that in religion today. Too little love for Allah's servants because there's too much pride, anger, confusion, arrogance. So these are just some of the consequences of Tawheed. But Tawheed is nothing if it remains just in the brain and in the theological manuals and doesn't enter the heart and doesn't transform the way that we are. Tawheed should help us not just to affirm the unity of the Creator, but to help us to remember the, uni the unity of the human race as well. Everybody is either Ummat al Dawa or Ummat al Ijaba. Everybody has either been, it's either to be called or has responded, but they were all there, as it were, at the time when the angels bowed down to Adam, alayhi salam. They all have that karramna bani Adam. We've ennobled the descendants of Adam. They all have the ismat al-adamiya, as the Maturidi scholars refer to it, the inviolability of belonging to the Adamic family. This is the true consequence of tawheed. Pay no attention to disrespect mistrust those who talk about tawheed but whose hearts are not overflowing with love for Allah's creatures. Barakallahu feekum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.